Good evening all, and welcome. They say your school days are some of the best in your life. Was that the case for you? Let me know down below. For these people, it's debatable. Just a friendly reminder, the book that I have collaborated on, True Darkness, launched yesterday. If you missed yesterday's video, there is actually the first chapter read for all of you to listen to in it, and I highly recommend it. If not, regardless, I hope you'll at least check it out. And if you do have it and are reading it already, please don't forget to drop a review as they are extremely helpful. Link in the description. But anyway, for now it's time to get comfortable, get your pencils out, and let the darkness take control. I'm from a very small, very rural town, with around 200 people, 25 miles from the nearest bigger town. Somehow, we have an elementary school, and when I was going there, it was K-8. The entire time I went to school there, I felt as if I were being watched. Going to the high school in the next town solidified that something was off about that building, as the feeling went away entirely. Everything that happened was specifically centered around the girl's bathroom and the gym. I'm just going to kind of list these by what grade they happened to me in. While I was in first and second grade, handprints would appear on the mirror in the girl's bathroom. Now obviously kids handprints, but higher up than any of us in the class could reach. No one would own up to it. But it could be explained as an older kid, not wanting to get in trouble for making a mess. As far as I remember, however, some of them would appear first thing in the morning, before any kids had arrived and after the bathrooms had been cleaned the previous evening. In third grade, I went into the girls bathroom and went into the middle stall. The other two were open and empty, yet once I sat down on the toilet, I saw shoes in the next stall next to mine and got chills down my spine. I left the bathroom as quickly as I could. I should also mention that the stall I was in, I saw shoes, and also had the mirror on the other side of it. In fourth grade, I saw a tall blonde girl standing on the bench behind me in the mirror. I turned around and she wasn't there. When I turned back to the mirror, she was gone. In sixth grade, I was in the balcony of the gym with some friends after basketball practice. In one corner of the gym, there was paper posted with recess rules. The paper definitely didn't face of its own accord. Something grabbed onto it and pulled it entirely off the wall. I remember the room going cold, and we pretty much booked it out of there and went our separate ways. In seventh grade, I got my first cell phone. The computer lab is separate from the school, and its porch was a common hangout spot for kids in town after school and during the summer. We were screwing around with the negative setting on my new phone, taking pictures in the back of the school. The back door is right next to the entrance to the previously mentioned corner of the gym. The doors have windows in the top half, and in one of the pictures there was an obvious head in the corner of the windows. In the pictures taken before and after, there was nothing there. Not sure if it had anything to do with the negative setting, but I'm not sure we would have noticed it without it. No one was in the building. It was probably around July, but I broke that phone beyond retrieving them. In eighth grade, I finally asked my mum if she thought the school could be haunted, as she is not from around here. She suggested that I ask my aunt, who has lived here all her life. I asked my aunt straight up if she thought the school was haunted, and immediately said, well, you know your cousin died in there, right? I told her I'd heard a story of a girl who collapsed and died during PE a long time ago. In the corner of the gym, there were a few weird things that happened. My aunt told me that was my cousin Lisa. She was 11 when she died of a heart condition no one was aware of. My aunt was 17 at the time, and I described the girl I saw in the bathroom years before. Tall, with shoulder-length, stick, straight hair. According to my aunt, 
that described her almost perfectly. It explained, at least to me, why I had seen these things throughout the years, and only ever in the girls' bathroom and the gym. Why I had felt like I was being watched, but never in a malevolent way. Why I felt an immense sense of relief upon going to high school, because I didn't have to look over my shoulder all the time and fear I would see something that wasn't meant to be there. It gave me some closure, some explanation, and made me less fearful of the school. I still get a chill down my spine when I go in though. I was dating a girl on the rifle team I was on. We stayed late after school and practiced shooting. We were in ROTC. This was in Alabama, in the 90s. We stayed up until 7pm, then her mum would pick us up. We'd normally wait in the band room because it looked out onto the parking lot. This night it's late, dark, cold, winter time, and the only people in the building are me, her, and our sergeant major, who was a tunnel rat in Vietnam, by far the hardest and most intense man I'd ever known. And the dude really inspired me. Great example of humanity. Anyway, me and her are standing in the band room, looking out this window, when about six feet away from us, this huge double set of tubular bells suddenly starts vibrating and shaking violently. I turn and look at it, and before I can say anything, the whole instrument flies at us, flipping over at the end. It crashes past me about two feet away and smashes into the wall on the other side of the room. I hit 100% pure flight or flight panic. I don't look at her. I don't say, hey, did you see that? I just bolt and run as fast as I could for the sergeant major. I didn't look back. I didn't stop. I find the sergeant major in his office. And only then do I stop and turn around. She's half a step behind me, completely pale. We freak out, tell him everything. And he just tells us to stay in his office and goes to look. He comes back a minute later and asks if we were messing with the bells, because they are a mess on the floor, and we say no, and explain it again. The sergeant major just nods, and we all wait in his office. Then he escorts us out to her mum's car, through the band room. That was the last I ever heard about it from him. Me and the girl stopped seeing each other, and I've lost contact with her, but I'm positive she would tell the exact same story. I was in around fourth grade at the time. One of my teachers blew the whistle to let us know that recess was over and we had to line up. The teachers did a head count and noticed that one of the students were missing, my friend Annie. Now my school had a few trees on the playground making a little forest. One of the students noticed that there was a girl sitting under the tree. Everyone looked and saw the same thing. A girl with brown hair sitting under a tree, her back turned to us. Anne also has brown hair, so we assumed it was her. We all called for her, but she didn't move. And one of my teachers decided to go and get her. We all watch, waiting for her to fetch Anne. When I felt a tap on my shoulder, it was Anne. She explained that she went to get her jacket from the fence, which was no way near the forest. Everyone noticed she was there too, and we all looked back at the teacher who went down to get this girl. She was already walking up from the forest, no girl with her. The other teacher asked her what happened and the teacher said, I went down there and I look away from the girl for a second and she was gone. There's no way Anne could have walked up from the tree to us without someone noticing. The trees weren't that dense, and we were all watching. Not to mention she came from behind us, where the jacket fence was. My elementary school was extremely old. To make matters worse, just a year prior to this, a man ended his wife's life just down the street from the school. They had two kids that went to this very school. I'm unsure what happened to the kids, but one of the kids was a girl that was in my class. But ever since that happened, we haven't seen her or her brother since. Maybe she perished and is now haunting the school. I don't know, but the memory of the ghost girl still haunts me.
This happened when I was around first to third grade, which is approximately around 10 to 12 years ago. But this specific memory has permanently scarred me until now, and is most likely the reason I am no longer a religious person. In the Philippines, the majority of our schools are Catholic. Some private schools require students to go to church every first Friday of the month. The school I went to back in elementary was one of those. Basically, every first Friday of the month, the students would gather in their respective classrooms. First, before all of us would be led to the church, and the church we went to was connected to our school. Each grade and section had their own areas in the church, so our teachers would be able to monitor us. The pews my classmates and I sat on were around 10 rows away from the altar, so it was pretty close to the front. The nuns and other church staff usually sat at the first to third rows. I'm not sure if churches in other countries do this, but at the end of the ceremony here, people clap in celebration after hearing mass. I was sitting next to my close friend, and we decided to do something funny. We were around eight at the time, so our decision making skills weren't really the best. While the priest was saying the final blessing before ending the mass, my friend and I decided to clap. It was only one clap, but it was a loud one. The sound echoed in the church loud enough to catch the nun's attention. Finally, the mass ended, and the students were led back to their classrooms, except Ara. Enter the nun. She was old, between 60 to 70, wearing a black habit and was very wrinkly. She marched towards our area fuming and started demanding as to who made the clap noise. I ended up admitting it was me, but my friend didn't. So it was only me who got into trouble. The nun told my advisor to let me stay in the church and my teacher obliged gathered the rest of the students and left. I was alone at this point and bawling. The nun went off somewhere and I was a small eight year old child who was left alone in a big church, aside from the janitor who was cleaning the floors. Chills were literally running through my body. How would you feel if you were left alone with all these scary statues looking down upon you? The atmosphere felt really creepy and eerie. The design and architecture of the church was gothic, so it only fueled my fear further. When the janitor began to clean near my area, I was begging him to let me out of the church, but he refused, stating that he was only following orders. Eventually, the nun comes back for me, grabs my wrist harshly, and tugs me out of the church and into their sleeping quarters. Quick note, in private schools in the Philippines, nuns and priests were residents and had sleeping quarters within campus. While the nun literally dragged me to their sleeping quarters, I grabbed onto a ledge near the gate, still screaming and thrashing around. We were outside this time, and the nannies and other guardians of the other students were looking on, but none of them did anything to intervene. I spot my nanny from afar and can see her looking at me in concern, but she stayed rooted to her spot. Once we were inside the nun's sleeping quarters, she throws me to the bed and begins yelling, telling me what I did was wrong and that I have sinned, and threatened me that she would lock me up in her room for a week. She even locked her door for emphasis. I was beyond scared at this point. She looked at me in the eyes and asked me if I would do it again, shaking her finger in my face. I shook my head furiously, and I remember her reiterating that she'd keep me in her room, but for only three days this time. I told her I would never do it again, and after what seemed like hours, she finally let me out. I was shaking when I returned to the classroom. We didn't really do anything to report the incident. I'm not sure if my nanny told my parents what happened, but if they did, they didn't come forward to file a complaint. 
So to this day, while entering that church, I still get goosebumps. My family gets very annoyed at me when I don't go to church on Sunday, but at this point, I really don't care. This particular experience happened when I was in fifth grade. My fifth grade teacher decided to have all of us students paint ceramic figurines as Christmas gifts for our parents. And so she decided to do this project in the old band hall above our gym. Our elementary school at the time was the high school back in the 1930s, and the band hall had been unused for many years. So our first day doing the project, she led us up to this dark staircase. And when she reached the top, she flipped the light over the staircase, and we turned and faced this long hallway lined with doors, some open, some closed. And this hallway was the only way to the main room where she decided to do our painting. I immediately felt uneasy, like I was being watched down this long hallway and I would peer into the rooms where the doors had been left unopened. I couldn't see much because they were pitch black and a shiver went down my spine. Once I got to the main room, our teacher got us settled in and we chose our figurines to paint. I chose a planter in the shape of a cat. My plan was to paint it all black with blue eyes and a pink nose. Now my mum has painted ceramic figures my whole life and taught me so I finished my figurine before my classmates finished theirs. My teacher tasked me with refilling old cans with water for my classmates. The room with the sink was at the end of the hall to the left. I'm standing in the sink, cleaning out the cans and refilling water. When behind me is a door that leads to what I'm assuming was the old band director's office. And I hear several knocks on the door behind me and I slowly turn the knob with a shaking hand. The room is empty, but the other door on the other side of the room was open, and I could see the top of the staircase. I roll my eyes to think my classmates were playing some kind of practical joke. So I carry the water cans into the main room, put the cans in the tables, and start collecting the others that needed to be cleaned and refilled. On my way out to the room, I stopped and asked my teacher if anyone has left the room. She looked at me puzzled and said, No, why do you ask? I thought I heard someone knocking a door back there, I said. My teacher giggles a little, pats my shoulder. It's an old building, an old building's creak. I'm sure it was nothing, she said. And I walk back to the room with the sink. I start washing the cans in soapy water and one was lying on its side on the counter next to me all by itself. And then it began rolling back and forth, like someone was playing with it, and would roll it really close to the edge, but then back again. I was frozen with fear, and then it stopped as fast as it started. Then there was a loud bang on the window next to me. I jumped and looked out the window, but we were on the second floor. The only way there could have been a bang on the window was if someone had thrown something at it, but there was no one out there. I hurried and filled the cans and walked very fast to the main room with my heart pounding. A week later, we were in the classroom, my previous experiences almost forgotten. I had finished my classwork and was reading my book. My teacher was touching up some of the figurines and she called my name and I went up to her. Could you go into the band hall and get the peach color paint? She asked. My heart started pounding. Ah, uh, can Chris go with me? You're the only one who's done the classwork. She hands me the key and I walk over to the gym and the door that led to the creepy old band hall. I just stood there terrified, but being a kid, I wasn't about to not do something my teacher asked me for. So I unlocked the door and made my way up the dark staircase and cursed the person who so brilliantly decided to put the light switch at the very top and not the bottom where I was standing. I took a deep, steaming breath and ran up as fast as I could and flipped on the light switch. And then I'm faced with the dark, creepy hallway that lined the doors. I was breathing hard from running up the stairs and my heart was pounding in my chest with fear. 
So I decided to make a mad dash down the hallway and into the main room where we had been painting just the week before. I found the paint my teacher requested, and I noticed all the shades hanging in front of the window were moving back and forth, but there wasn't any air in the room, and the windows weren't open. And then I heard moaning that quickly turned to laughing, and I ran for it. Down the hall, down the stairs, I flew out the door to the bottom of the stairs and slammed the door shut behind me and locked it. I noticed in my haste, I didn't turn off the stairwell light, but I didn't care. I wasn't about to go back to turn it off. Till this day, I remember that old terrifying band hall and it being my most terrifying paranormal experience to date. This story happened back in my freshman year of high school. It was my second day in that school and I was still getting used to how big my school was and how far away it was from my house. The first time I went to my school was for freshman orientation with my mother. The first period of the day, I got lost and ended up on the wrong side of the school. After correcting my mistake, I went on throughout the day as normally as I possibly could. It was around the beginning of eighth period, which was my last period of the day, when I ran into my best friend. We caught up a bit, when I said I'll continue our chat via messaging, and he said alright, and hurried to his class as I hurried to mine. During our chat, he told me his schedule was a 2-9 meeting, meaning he started classes at 8-10am, and dismissed at 2.50. My schedule was 1-8, I started at 7-10am, and dismissed at 2. Once I was dismissed from school, I messaged him, telling him I was waiting for him to go home, since we go home in the same direction. I get off four stops before him, and he said, Sure, sounds good. I waited about an hour, and when the bell rang, I looked everywhere for him. I looked left and right and left again, but couldn't find him. So I continued until everyone had already left the front of the school entrance. I got confused and worried and messaged him again, asking where he was. He replied five minutes later, saying he was 20 minutes away from his house. His mother had come to pick him up. Not knowing what to do, I just left the school area and walked towards my bus stop, except I was still new to the neighborhood and still did not know the exact block my bus stopped at. It was a public bus and not one of those yellow school buses. And since I didn't know the block of my bus stop, I ended up walking past it without knowing. I continued to walk around aimlessly until my senses returned to me and I snapped back to reality. Me being the dumbass I was, I continued to walk down a neighborhood I didn't know. The streets were relatively empty, except when I looked across the street and saw another kid. I thought, oh okay, there's someone else here. He was under a tree, so I couldn't really see his face, but I knew we made eye contact. I sighed in relief, because at least I wasn't the only one in the streets. I walked about 15 blocks in total and saw that the dude was still behind me, but across the street. I thought nothing of it at first, because maybe he lives around here. But soon I started to get a weird feeling and a weird vibe from the dude. So in an attempt to see if I was just being paranoid, I walked across the street and down near the park. I didn't walk into the park, I just stood at the corner of the crosswalk. I waited there for two to three minutes, all the while pretending to be texting a friend. I looked up and saw the creepy dude. Now that he wasn't in the shade anymore, I kind of got his face better. This dude looked like he was a year or two older than me. At this point, I was panicking, so I pretended to call my mum to see if he'd leave me alone. He didn't. He was still standing there across the street with a weird and unsettling smirk on his face. The moment that smirk appeared on his face, a huge red flag was waving in my head and telling me to avoid that guy at all costs. I nervously walked past him and he was trailing behind me, still across from the street. Then he crossed the street so we'd be on the same block. 
I ran like my life depended on it, which it very well may have done, and I was out of breath very quickly. I look over my shoulder and he was gaining on me. He had this crazed look in his eyes, like I was his prey. I turned the corner and with this sudden burst of energy ran into the nearest shop, a pharmacy, and hid behind denial and peeked out from behind a shelf of school supplies. Out the display window, I could see him running up to the corner and looking around for me. The corner was one of those four-way intersections. I could have run up, left, and or right. He looked around frantically, and with a few seconds left at the traffic light, he decided to continue running up. I waited for about two minutes until I came out my hiding spot. I didn't even remember thanking the shop owners for letting me hide there but left and didn't look back. I looked at my phone and saw that it was almost 6.30. My phone was on 10% and I was completely lost without a doubt. I didn't want to go back down the block I just ran from, in fear that he might back down to look for me. So I turned left and continued down the block until I saw my school. I walked carefully and looked at each block until I saw my bus stop sign. I sighed in relief and waited for the bus. The scary thing is that I don't remember his face, his ethnicity or anything. I took a good look at his face during the moment, but to this day I'm still unsure if I'd be able to identify him. He could have walked past me in the halls at school or outside in the street, and I'd have been none the wiser. And don't worry, I'm not the dumb, naive little girl I was back then. Now I know that if I'm ever in danger, I will call someone. I should let the store owners know next time too. But at the time, the owners were talking to an elderly woman, so I didn't want to seem rude. And one last thing, the block with the pharmacy and other stores ended up being the block where my new best friend actually lives. I attend what some people call the most haunted college in Indiana. And me being a horror enthusiast, found it fit to attend this place in hopes that I see something. That was a very unconscious choice I made because honestly, I didn't really want to see anything remotely paranormal. There's a legend here that there was a sister, as this is a Catholic school founded in 1840, who was extremely good at painting, and she would spend weeks on detail. Which is true, her paintings are everywhere in the school. So once she decided to do a self-portrait of herself, she did everything but the face. This is because she got sick and passed, leaving an unfinished portrait of this faceless nun. There's part of the legend that says a sister heard crying where the painting was, and when she looked in the room, there was the nun crying with no face. The chapel on campus even went as far as to doing a service dedicated to her, to supposedly make the sighting stop. Now, I honestly didn't believe this, but I can't lie and say it didn't make me want to attend the school more. I just didn't know her entire story when I applied. When I got to my dorm a few weeks in, I had my first encounter. I was in bed, but since my roommate and I liked the room to be freezing, I woke up around two in the morning because I wanted to fetch a sweater. So I sat up and in the corner of my room behind the door and in front of my fridge was this tall black figure. The only thing I could really make out was the shape of the top of her nun habit. I called my roommate's name a few times, hoping she'd answer, and fortunately she did. Kaylee, being a devout Catholic, didn't want to look, so I shined my phone light on it, but it was gone. I'd have thought it was just a shadow of my lamp or something, but even when I removed the light, the shape and vividness of the habit hadn't gone away, but it was gone. If that wasn't enough to scare me, I decided to listen to some good old Chris Tomlin to go to bed. YouTube wasn't on my side that night because I'd gotten an ad for The Nun right before it, which freaked me out. Because if you don't know, 
Chris Tomlin is a Christian singer. After that, I decided to just go to sleep after giving my mum a very teary phone call. And that's when I had my first experience with sleep paralysis at school. The first time it happened, I couldn't tell you where I was, but I remember there was this dark figure in the corner of my eye that my older brother later referred to as a shadow person. It lasted for about 10 minutes, maybe. The second time I was clearly in my room and I could see Kaylee sleeping in her bed across from mine, but there was a person in our room. I was trying to call out to her, but for obvious reasons, there was no sound for her to hear. The third and longest time I woke up in between two segments and saw the same thing in my dream when I was awake. Kaylee was sleeping in the same position she was in when I was paralyzed and that same person was getting much closer to her. I can tell that it was her, the nun, but each time it loses its nun shape and becomes more blobby. A few things happened between the third and fourth encounter. The biggest and only one worth mentioning was my wall and the posters. I was told by a sister and a student that the faceless nun targets elementary majors since she was an elementary major, supposedly. She'd ran out of our school already, a girl one year ahead of me, and the student had been her roommate. She said that her posters would never stay on the wall after she left, and that things would be randomly moved. I didn't believe this, even though it freaked me out since Kaylee and I are both Ed majors. But I just thought, it had to do with our walls not being repainted or Kaylee moving my things. But the room had some suspicious dried dark handprints and two spots on our wall that made me nauseous to look at. This fourth time, I awoke somewhere between sleep paralysis, which added to the scare factor. I remember hearing trap music just playing in our room. Kaylee said, Hey, do you hear that? But I was turned towards the wall so she couldn't see my face, and that my eyes had to be open because I could see. I felt her touching me, almost rocking my body to get my attention, and I remember thinking, stop, I don't have a shirt on. It was still raining, but I could feel her moving me, and I was panicking because Kaylee was scared and I couldn't do anything to help her. So I woke up, or at least I thought I did, and Kaylee was sitting up and talking to me, but I knew it wasn't real because of the look on her face. And I asked where Kaylee was, and I blinked, and Kaylee was lying down again. Then my fuzzy pink blanket was on the floor, and it looked like someone was sitting with their arms on their knees. And I asked Kaylee what that was, and she said, the ghost is under my bed. And the blanket fell, and something started talking under her bed but I couldn't move or talk. It was like I had entered sleep paralysis again, which I was, but before that I was too, and I was able to talk to Kaylee in my dream? I don't know, this is very confusing. I remember trying to recite the Lord's Prayer, and I did, but I woke up again, this time in church, and I couldn't move. I was seeing Kaylee leaving church and talking to the priest wearing his white collar. But then she called him out for acting weird, and I kid you not, I think I saw the devil himself, and he told her to get the hell out of my church, and this time I woke up for real. I haven't even begun to analyze the fourth time, but I'm sharing it with you because I am at such a loss for words as to why I'm being targeted, and why I'm seeing it around Kaylee. If anyone has any scientific basis for this, please help me debunk it. I just want to be able to sleep at night. The paralysis has happened continually. There also may not be a paranormal connection to this, but honestly, it feels like that's what it is. So anyone able to come forward to offer me peace of mind would be extremely appreciated. The year was 2011. I was 17 and I was a typical high school student during the last year of school. I studied hard and mostly cared about the finals, 
but also secretly longed for some overwhelming romantic love in my life. My high school was affiliated with the university. So every autumn we had students who came to do their teaching internships or practice. It usually lasted two or three months, depending on the subject they taught. And usually they were female interns who came. This year was an exception. A new intern was an extremely good looking guy. And it was not me blind with love who thought so. Later, I found out he worked as a male model in our city, who was around 25 and taught maths and had this geeky charm. Even though he didn't teach in my class, at least half of the girls there had a crush on him. And it is not an exaggeration to say that a fair share of the school got crazy. It was no exception, of course. So I every time I saw him in the corridors smiled and tried to catch his eye. Because in my head, he looked like a perfect Prince Charming. And with every day, I was more and more into him. I thought he also may have liked me. But you can never be sure with these matters until something happens. And something happened. Although I wish it never did. He found me on social media and wrote me a message from an empty profile saying that he'd been watching me and that I'm beautiful and that he wanted to get to know me. Romantic, right? I couldn't believe my eyes when I got it. It was a dream come true. He asked me a whole bunch of different questions, ranging from my favorite movie to where I live. And it turned out that we lived nearby. In the first evening, we chatted all night. And he even suggested doing a romantic thing as to turn the lights on and off in the window so that we could see each other. He was finishing his practice in our school at the time. So he called me for a date after it. I agreed, but decided to slow down and to communicate only via social media, as I was super shy in real life and needed time to adapt. That's when it started to get creepy. First, he started to tell me that I was meant for him. And there was no way around it. And he felt it the first time he saw me. But judging from my answers to his questions, he understood that I do not behave correctly, and that I needed guidance. I wanted a career, I wanted to study in the big city while a woman should care for her man and her family only. So I should stay in my hometown with him was what he expected. His logic was that he was my fate. And our meeting had happened with purpose. So what else to look for in the world? He offered me his educational services through some religious stories he sent to me through abstracts from the Bible that I began to receive daily from the second day after we met. He started to get on my nerves. I didn't like him anywhere near as much anymore. But only after the next creepy thing did I become truly concerned. In three or four days since we had met, he came over to my house and asked the concierge the number of my flat. Since after the first evening, he knew that I lived on the top floor and tried to get into it. Fortunately, she did not let him. He wrote a message to me that he wanted to do a surprise for me and perhaps meet my parents. This was when I understood that this is not romantic and actually abnormal. I told him I needed a break from our communication and blocked him on social media. He didn't want to take a break. And he started to follow me on my way from school to home. As he said, to talk and to clarify that he only wanted good for me, which was exceptionally creepy. And while the first day he followed me to the bus stop, further down the line, he started to follow me until my very home. Luckily, I told my friends about it. And they went with me to prevent him from doing so. All that seemed to infuriate him more. At some point down the line, he managed to track my phone number. And during his last days in school, I would receive messages like I'm in the school building, run and hide. I imagine you're also scared hiding in the girls bathroom while I'm here. Then the peak of the story was when I came back home from school, 
and I had three days break from his attempts to talk to me. And the concierge told me that the guy came again and left a box for me. I didn't know what to do with it. So I brought it home. And he wrote me an SMS that if I open the box, he will leave me alone. I decided to throw it away. After I peeked inside and saw that there were some chocolates and a treat for my dog. But at that point, I did not exclude the fact that it could be unsafe. After all of this, I finally told my mum about this mess. Because before that, she was only acutely aware of the romantic side of the story. She opted to interfere immediately once she got the details. She took his phone number, called him and said that if he didn't leave me alone, she would be informing the school administration about his actions and he would have problems at the university with both the practice and his ethics principles in general. I would love to say that he disappeared forever after that. But no, nope. this all was happening in March. And when he graduated in June, he started writing and tried to stalk me again, judging from reports by my grandmother. But this time he could not. I got accepted to a big city university and moved there soon enough. So creepy intern guy, when I come to my hometown for a visit, I hope we never meet again. This story begins when I was in fourth grade. So I was about nine. As I was a bit young for my grade, because of me being younger than the other kids, I didn't really get along with them very well. So whenever we would go out to recess, I would make sure to bring whatever book I was reading at the time. I had my own special place I liked to sit and read. It was a little corner of the playground where barely anybody went. It was a large patch of clovers and other overgrown plants and had a large bush with a gap in between it and the fence. I used to love to sit there. One day I went over to my usual spot and sat with my back facing the bush. I had been reading for a while when I thought I heard a rustling sound behind me. Sometimes squirrels and chipmunks would hang out in the gap between the bush and the fence. So I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard heavy breathing and someone tugging on my pigtails. Surprised, I whipped my head around, thinking my hair had gotten caught on a branch or something. But instead, there was a boy. He was sitting hunched in a gap between the fence and the bush, leaning forwards between the branches of his face, mostly obscured by leaves, and his arm outstretched, trying to grab at my hair. I screamed, bolted for the picnic table area where the supervising teachers were. I was a very shy little thing back then. So I didn't say anything. Instead, for a long time after that, I sat and read by the teachers during recess. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I made a new friend Matt. He was also a bit of an outcast. And when we got assigned to be in a reading group together, we became friends fast. He was nice enough. But even my nine year old self could tell there was something off about him. He was too clingy, barely ever leaving my side and constantly coming up with excuses to touch me. I of course didn't have any other friends. So I ignored it. However, one day he told me that he liked me. I had no idea how to react to this and just said nothing. He apparently took my silence as a yes, because he called my home phone later. My mum handed me the phone saying that a friend was asking to talk to me. Since my parents were watching TV downstairs, I decided to go up to my room so I wouldn't bother them. It was Matt. I could barely even say hello before he started saying some seriously weird stuff. He started saying things like, what do you want to name our kids? When we get to high school, let's run away and start a family. I bet you look really cute when you're asleep. Now this would be creepy for anyone, but I was nine. 
I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I just stayed away from him. He wasn't happy about this, constantly glaring at me, and just being all around super creepy. A year later, I was halfway through fifth grade and had a serious bully problem. Now that's a story for another day. It got so bad that my dad decided one day to not wait until the next school year and instead switched schools the following Monday. Fifth grade at my new school was great. And starting in sixth grade, my parents got me my first phone. I, of course, called up Clara, who became my friend after the Matt incident, and I let her know about my new phone. A couple more months passed, and one night, I got a call from an unknown number. Picking up the phone, I froze when I heard Matt's voice. I still vividly remember what he said. Hey, baby, I missed you so much. Why'd you leave me? Not even a second after he had said that, I hung up, blocked his number and called up Clara, as she was the only person at my old school who had my number. Apparently after school, he had asked to see her phone to call his mum, as he had forgotten his at home. She handed it over to him, as she was very kind, but quite a gullible girl, and soon she noticed that he was taking a while and then had a pen out and was writing something on his arm. She yanked the phone away and panicked, sprinting off. Looking down at her phone, she saw that he had opened my contact info. I was freaked out, but felt safe as I had blocked his number. That didn't stop him though. He would call me every single week from a different phone, leaving at least 10 messages each time. Each time I would block one number, he'd somehow call from another one. When I got a new phone, the calls stopped, and I forgot about it until freshman year. At my high school, there were a couple of kids from my old school, and I suddenly remembered Matt. I asked one of the boys, Harry, if he knew what happened to Matt. According to Harry, he got expelled. Teachers had caught him smelling and touching girls' hair, groping female students, and trying to sneak into the girls' locker room, and writing extremely explicit stuff about himself and other girls in the grade, as well as a few other things which I can't remember. The realization hit me like a semi-truck. Smelling and touching girls' hair? The boy hiding in the bush when I was in fourth grade? Matt? Let's never meet again. My younger years were spent moving from place to place, chasing whatever work my father could find. It never bothered us much, because we still had each other as a constant. We moved to this one small town in the middle of central Louisiana. It was such a small isolated town that they confused my northern accent with a speech impediment, as they had never encountered an accent other than their own. But the town was beautiful, with plenty of old-fashioned buildings and very kind and friendly people. But it was the school that would drive fear into me. My first day there, and I was walking down the hall to where my class was. I was excited to be there, hoping to make some friends before moving on to the next town and the next job. However, I noticed something very odd as I made my way down the hall. I could feel regular bumps in the floor, but I could see with my eyes that the floor was actually flat. But I could feel them. I could feel something else, something I was familiar with. Could it be the presence of the dead? I had always been able to connect to the dead. Well, I could feel them in my bones. And that is why, and still is why, I could never go to a graveyard. The feeling of being surrounded with that many lost souls would drive me towards a complete breakdown. So when I felt them under my feet, under that plain checkerboard floor tile, I knew I was in for a ride. All day, every day, I would see flashes of movement out of the corner of my eye. Sometimes it would just be a simple shadow, 
Other times I would see them as clearly as if they were alive. Some were pristine, others trapped in the glory after effects of whatever violent death they had suffered. But it was more than just seeing them. I was used to that. It was their chatter, the non stop buzz of voices that followed me around the school. I struggled every day to ignore them and offer fell back on prayer just for a few moments of peace. But they always returned. The one event that cemented it all in place was during a tornado drill, whether by design or fortunate accident, the lights in the school went out as soon as the teachers had us in the hallway, where we were supposedly going to be safe during the bad weather. I lifted my head up and looked around. And they were there. The salts. Some no different than the living, but others were mutilated messes. Terrified, I buried my head between my arms and didn't move until the lights returned. I would never see them like that again. But the image stuck with me to this day. After leaving the town, I found out that the school had been built on a graveyard, one that spanned back nearly 200 years. Everyone from innocent children to hardworking farmers and bloodthirsty cultists were buried in the ground under my feet. I was glad I was only there for a few months, and thankfully, didn't cultivate any friendships that would make me want to return. I was glad to be away from that place, and glad that I never encountered another school like that again. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's return to school. A nice mix of stories in here. A huge thank you as always to my wonderful patrons for your regular support. Your donations really help me out and it keeps the channel running. For as little as a dollar a month, you can have your name at the end credits of every video, as well as a heap of other rewards for a little bit more money. The choice is yours. If you're interested, link in the description. And the link at the very top of it is to the book I was telling you about at the start. It really would mean a lot to me if you would check it out. So just have a little think about it. If something terrifying has happened to you, and you would like it narrated, send it to my email or my Reddit. But for now, guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.